I'm really excited for diving into discussion about AI ecosystem and accelerators. Joining me today are panelists from some of the most innovative companies in the world, starting with Andrew Feldman, CEO and co-founder of Cerebrus Systems, Justin Hotter, Executive Vice President and General Manager of AI and Data Center Business at Intel, Steve Scott, Corporate Fellow, Heading the Networking and System Architecture at AMD, and Shimon Ben-David, CTO of Weka. What were the things we are hearing from the customers or industry with respect to this revolution that we are witnessing? Uh, what did you hear about? What are the requirements that uh, came to your mind uh, that uh, got you embarked on this particular journey? In uh, fall of 2015, and AI was very much on the horizon and, and not yet uh, close by. Um, there was uh, a lot of work done in, in vision, in the, the computer vision category, but this was long before large language models emerged. First, what the, what the founders wrote on the whiteboard was that we wanted to work together again, and that we wanted to do something important. That we, we wanted to, to, to try and move an entire industry. And as we began to explore different problems, the, the challenges that AI presented were interesting to us. We, we observed that um, uh, it wasn't obvious to us that a machine built for pushing pixels to a monitor right, which is what a, a graphics processing unit was designed for. We, it wasn't sure, obvious to us why that would be good at AI. And that we thought that there would be a, an opportunity to build a dedicated machine optimized for AI. And we, we thought for sure that we, we could build a, a better machine than a wide vector SIMD processor with limited memory bandwidth, which is the, the, the family of uh, that the graphics processing unit lives in. We spoke to dozens of customers. Everybody was having trouble with training times. It was the limiting factor and it remains to this day, the limiting factor on iteration time. Uh, we, we've added some new limiting factors, how long it takes to set up graphics processing units, how long it takes to distribute uh, a model over a large number of GPUs. And it turns out that the, the, the chosen path uh, that we embarked on turned out to be very, very good at those. So I wanted to ask you, um, uh, what's your take on um, uh, customers' point of view? What are customers asking for when it comes to machine learning and AI workloads and system architecture and systems in general? Sure. Well, I mean, mostly AI is just driving a huge appetite for performance. You know, everybody's constrained by budgets and space and power. Um, the colo rates are, are historically low, like less than 2%. I've heard that over 80% of new data centers that are under construction are already leased. So one of the things that customers are asking us about is, is uh, or are talking to us about, is just the need to consolidate their general purpose compute to make up space, free up space and power for AI. Um, so a lot of our AI interest is actually on the epics side with people using epic cpus um, to consolidate their their older servers uh because they're 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 very power efficient and 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 uh people are seeing like a five to eight x consolidation possible with uh, um from older servers and then for the for the ai infrastructure itself people are just looking for choice and flexibility and competition um they obviously want better price performance for training but especially for inference which is really the larger part of the market mm -hmm. and most of the inference is done on cpus but the high-end inference is all being done on gpus and and uh we're pretty consistently hearing that people are looking for a second source for their accelerators. Um, and so a lot of interest in the in the uh, AMD Instinct 300X. Uh, I, I think over 80% of enterprises now are, are deploying generative AI models that have been optimized for the 300X. So that's been, been, been a great um, success story for us. When I look at the infrastructure for the AI data centers, the three sort of legs of the infrastructure compute Networking, of course, that we come from and storage or data platform that you guys provide. So I think I would really like to start by asking you, uh, what is your take on, you know, the role that a data platform or storage plays uh, in uh, ML data centers? Um, so I think there's this conception 
that uh, obviously AI, ML, definitely Gen AI requires massive amounts of data, and, and that's definitely true. Yeah. More than that, if we're looking at the different stages of the pipeline between uh, that, that exist in, in, in AI and Gen AI, a lot of them are very storage oriented. So definitely accumulating massive amounts of data. You need you need a location, a cost effective capacity environment that can accommodate the protocol of the ingestion of the data, but also the scale of the data ingested. And this could be from worldwide fleets of data. This could be data brokers. This could be HPC simulation data created. So you need to be able to accommodate for it. Then the different stages of data uh, are more or less intensive. And the interesting thing is that uh, every stage has its own IO pattern. Uh, may, maybe I'll summarize with uh, there's uh, massive requirements for storage or data environments in AI that behave completely different than traditional enterprise storage or traditional HPC storage. It's almost it's it's a new thing completely. One of the things I wanted to learn from you is that. Uh, what are the things you hear from customers with respect to requirements as we are uh, sort of going uh, very strong with uh, machine learning training, inferencing, those workloads are becoming very important. Um, you know, I, I think this is a uh, this has been an incredible journey, right? AI, uh, you're, you're right. A, a few years ago, we were talking about AI and, and HPC and supercomputing as a as an emerging workload. And, and uh, you know, of course, with the advent of, uh, of ChatGPT, all of a sudden, it became the dominant workload, and now we're building supercomputers all over. And I think, um, I think that probably gets to some of the challenges. I think, first of all, um, one of the biggest challenges in this space for for customers is uh, is data center capacity, power, the capex, the compute intensity. I mean, the the level of investment in this space, and we've obviously seen it explode. And I think while while everybody is eager to get on on board and start to to use uh, Gen AI, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's the reality is it's a big it's a big investment, and that's why you know one of the things we're doing at Intel is trying to provide lower uh, lower cost access points, things like our you know our developer cloud where we can give access to uh, to customers to uh, to get started to learn to to test some of the the ideas and tools that they have. Um, the second thing I would say is it's it's really all about leveraging the data that enterprises have you know over 80 percent of the world's data is, is in enterprises the majority of its proprietary compute has generated so much data over the last few decades the advent of mobile and the internet and cloud of course but now we're talking about how do we unlock that data to generate new services new insights new sources of productivity and i think that um one of the things that we're seeing with you know with with use cases like rag emerging as a potential enterprise use case is we need practical applications of data that recognize, um, you know, some of the foundational elements of data, data sovereignty, data locality, data gravity. I would like to come back to the data and storage, but since you also mentioned a lot of data being on-prem and on-prem infrastructure where people are making lots of investments, given the current focus on these vertically integrated proprietary systems, I want to get your thoughts on where you think industry should go or trying to go. Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, you know, we're we're veterans of the of the industry. We've always seen that technology adoption often requires a proprietary stack to start. But we also know open ecosystems win out over time. And I think if even if you look at um, uh, where we are in AI today, you know, whether it's um, uh, OCP, you know, the, the big drive around OCP standards, everything right. from the the boards we're designing, the modules we're designing, obviously PCIe cards, a longtime standard in the computing resource at the core hardware level to the networking interfaces, you know, UEC for scale out, um, UA link, which, you know, we're, we're a part of for, um, for scale up the software interfaces, PyTorch, OpenAI's Triton, um, the advent of open models. I think the industry is pretty clear, right? And, and when you look across the industry, Everybody wants um, open interoperable systems, open interoperable platforms, because we know over time, that's where um, most of the innovation will reside. And most importantly, it allows end, end customers, enterprises, 
uh, to uh, to innovate in the manners that are most relevant for them. So as you look at the end user and end user applications, they need the whole stack, right? It's not just chip, it's not just the system, there's a whole bunch of software and tools and so on. So what is your view of the, how do you deliver the entire stack and what does it take? And do you use a open ecosystem versus a closed system? I have a bunch of questions on that. Like like you guys at, at Juniper, we're we're system builders. And that means we build chips and uh, we build systems, printed circuit boards. We deliver the cooling, the power, the IO uh, to the chip. We package it in an enclosure and then we run the, the, the equivalent of the OS on it. And in our case, it was a compiler. Um, I think the industry uh, did us a huge favor in consolidating one of the, the real worries we had at the beginning when there was uh, Cafe and TensorFlow and PyTorch and all these other things was how are we gonna support all these languages? And right now, most work done in the industry is done in PyTorch. And that was a huge help. You know, we, we wanted to be sure that we uh, bolted on to the ecosystem in exactly the same way you wrote models for uh, competitive products for GPUs. Uh, you don't need a special switch. We use standard ethernet to communicate. All right. And this is obviously where, where you guys are strong. You don't need a particular NIC. Um, all of that was so that we could move in, in the ecosystem without extensive sort of insertion force. And, and the result is a, a system that uh, everybody writes to in PyTorch. Um, and they can use the exact same PyTorch that they used on, on, their, on their GPUs, um, only it runs faster. Since you mentioned uh, Ethernet, I'm going to jump into that. Uh, you know, traditionally people have looked at it from storage side. InfiniBand was the storage networking choice and people are bringing it into AI, ML. Uh, but as you mentioned, uh, Ethernet is probably the widely adopted, very scalable technology. So how do you see uh, networking requirements in the world you live in? I think uh, we are building uh, supercomputers to the tune of 20 plus exaflops a machine. And they include hundreds of, of our systems. And uh, the bisection bandwidth of the cluster is enormous. We, we use uh, Ethernet, we use 800 gigabit Ethernet. Um, and we, uh, we believe it's the, the ideal solution. Um, I, I think uh, I spent the first 15 years of my career in the networking industry. And I think e Ethernet is uh, a dominant force and everything that has tried to stand up against it has been rolled over and crushed, right? Those of us who are a little older, we remember Fiddy and we remember Token Ring and we remember Apple Talk and we remember Deckness and we remember all this stuff that just got bulldozed. Um, the community has worked together as an ecosystem really well and sort of a model for others to develop standards so that we can interconnect. And I, I think uh, betting against ethernet has, has been a very bad bet for 30 years. I think your brother was also involved in that, if I remember correctly. When I was thinner and you had hair and, and the that's world right. was a little exactly. bit different. No, I that, think that's, that's right. right. Yeah. I, I, exactly. We look back at some of the things and yeah, that, that, that was um, a really fun time to be in networking. Um, the, the mid to late 90s were an extraordinary time, sort of like now in AI. That's where right. in, inventions were, the field was rife with inventions. People were trying different things. And uh, uh, and now we, we've made ethernet transport and communication uh, approximately free so that other people with good ideas could, could build WhatsApp and a hundred other things and, and really change the world. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, I think Juniper and, and many other companies along the way played an important role in that. There's a huge bunch of stuff has to come together. Our question is, the, is the open ecosystem uh, ready for that? Is it going to be able to deliver truly interoperable uh, system architecture, which allows us to still optimize at every layer so that overall you get the power efficiency and performance you get needed for these workloads? 
So I spent much of my career at Cray, and I think I architected eight different generations of networks. And the first seven of them were all proprietary networks um, because you know, is Ethernet, Ethernet was not was not high performance. So, so we built dedicated supercomputer networks. Um, and then Cray realized back in, I'll oh, say, 2015, that supercomputing was becoming increasingly data driven. Ethernet was the de facto standard for, for data center communication. So rather than making another alternative to Ethernet, they could just make Ethernet networks as scalable and performant as their as their supercomputing networks were. And that that's really what begat um, the, the slingshot um, high performance Ethernet solution. And then today we also see Google and Amazon developing their own Ethernet extensions to run some of the largest clusters in the world. And then InfiniBand, which started as an open ecosystem, has ended up becoming a proprietary single vendor network. Um, so now we've got this community effort with Ultra Ethernet Consortium to make Ethernet the absolute best option for large-scale AI and HPC systems, but do it in an open and collaborative manner and have that interoperability that you mentioned. And it's going to end up being a, a more modern and scalable network than InfiniBand is. Um, it will implement packet spraying for really effective load balancing. It will implement selective retransmission on transient errors, which is much more efficient scale. It'll, it'll implement much more uh, effective congestion control mechanisms, et cetera. And then at the same time, leverage this huge ethernet ecosystem. So you get more competition, you get more innovation, and right. it's much more cost effective. The NICs, the switches, the cables are like half the cost of, of InfiniBand. Uh, you get a much more robust supply chain. Um, so overall, I actually expect ethernet is gonna provide better scaling and performance, and much better price performance. Uh, the biggest challenge there is, is really going to be about building these very, very large AI systems and uh, around management at scale. When you start talking about incredibly large systems, you'll have to deal with constant hardware failures. And so all the UEC work around telemetry and, and load balancing and congestion control and security, I think will be particularly important. Now, when I look at RAG plus inference, uh, looks like this is a very different kind of a challenge when it comes to storage and uh, even networking. So I want to get your thoughts on what is this so specific about RAG plus inferencing that touches upon storage requirements. Great question. So uh, maybe I'll start by explaining what RAG is. RAG retrieval augmentation. So eventually, when when training a model, the tr the model is aware of. Uh, the data that it was trained on. So it, you can query, you can answer, it can do things on the data that uh, it was trained on. However, um, organizations being dynamic, for example, if I trained uh, um, an insurance uh, mo model on my current regulations, maybe tomorrow I have new regulations added. And, and that's usually the case. You constantly have new data coming into your organization. So in the past, one thought was let's retune the model constantly. Retuning is much more effective than uh, training, but it's still a heavy operation. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. So there is this notion of let's point the model to, to my existing data. So let's retrieve the data and augment my model with, the, with my existing data. The way to do it, if you're looking at that, it's actually broken into different stages. You usually uh, are running another model uh, that goes over your company data and summarizes it and, and throws it into a vector database. Um, but but there's this notion of I'm running a model, I'm running something across all of my company data. So I, maybe I have uh, millions or billions of files, as, as is the case in, in a lot of organizations. And now I need to run something periodically that scans them or scan only new documents and converts them into vectors to, to throw into my data vector database. And these vector databases also increase in size. So so there's two types of storage requirements here. How, how fast can I run across all of my uh, data environment in, in my organization? And then how fast can I push it into a vector database, which eventually will be translated into how fast my, my LLM can inference on the data because it will get the data from the vector database. We're seeing customers that are maybe embedding once a day or, or even less, so or even once every few days. So... The, the implication is that when they're questioning their their model, the model always has a drift of at least a day uh, on on the data set. Um, while imagine a high performance storage, for example, Weka, that allows 
uh, massive metadata and data operations where you could embed much more, much more periodically, uh, every hour, every several hours, then your model suddenly is much more closer to your source of truth. So ragging is, is very important. It, it does have its own storage requirements. But how about the software ecosystem, right? Because you have PyTorch, we have you're open, we know there are pieces there, but you see all of these pieces coming together from software ecosystem perspective, because there are tools, there are SDKs, lots of things have to come together. Uh, I, I think we're gonna, you know, I think we're today we're in a world where there's there's um, you know, obviously PyTorch has kind of become the you know the the standard framework. There's a bunch of other uh frameworks, whether it's you know VLLM for for model serving, uh, you know, there's the, the the push is going to be towards more and more open standards. I think what OpenAI is pushing with Triton, you know, has, has really led the charge around, um, you know, uh, the, the full stack, uh, okay. you know, capability for for developers to really customize and optimize performance, um, you know, tune their models at very low levels for training. We're hearing that from customers. You know, customers don't want to deal with um, the the lift of trying to support one proprietary stack to another proprietary stack, especially customers that are looking at large scale investments. Uh, I would say, you know, there, there's always a place for proprietary tools that are also, of course, open source in nature so that customers can modify and tweak them. Um, and, you know, you mentioned OpenVINO, it's a great example. It's an open source tool. Final question I have for you is that, what is next for AMD? Where is AMD going to go? You know, obviously AMD is very, very interested in the AI market. Um, we're, you know, we're focused on customer requirements and execution, but we have a very broad approach to the AI market. Um, we have a, a, a rich portfolio um, from AI PCs. There's an incredible amount of interest now in AI PCs and client devices through the embedded space and our adaptive computing to server CPUs, to instincts and networks. So every part of our business is really contributing to a different part of the, of the AI ecosystem. Um, one thing that we're doing is in, increasingly um, uh, in investing more in this space, we're accelerating our instinct uh, GPU product to have an annual upgrade of our GPUs. And we're increasingly thinking holistically about full AI systems targeting the data center scale. So whereas traditionally AMD has been a processor company, we're now thinking about uh, the whole AI systems, um, software, hardware, all the way up to data center scale, but at the same time doing it with open standards. Uh, we, we believe very strongly in open standards and in partnerships in interoperability and, and having open software stacks. Um, so that part of the AMD culture is going to remain. So what is next for both the machine learning ecosystem as well as Cerebras? I, I think th the truth is right now is AI has uh, some work to do to deliver on its expectations. I, I think we have uh, extraordinary, extraordinary hopes. Um, we're just beginning to see this transition from training to inference. Uh, training doesn't go away. Training remains a huge uh, use of compute, but inference compute is a function of the number of users. It's a function of two things, really, the, the size of the model and the number of users and how often they use it. And so each one of those requests, each one of those prompts generates work for compute. And what we're seeing now is enterprise adoption. We're seeing really hard problems getting dropped by AI. Um, we're seeing other hard problems that were formulated in a different manner, like search, reformulated into AI, translation, right. reformulated into AI, right. and work that computers were bad at since their invention, understanding text, understanding images. The, th these were not the domain for computers, right? The, the domain for computers were the calculations. And suddenly AI has, has sort of enabled uh, the reach of compute, not just to the display of images, but to the understanding creation, and not just to the display of text, but to its understanding and its generation. And, and I think we, we, we got to wrap our arms around some of these and, and, and deliver value, whether it's in, in medicine or in drug design or in, in agriculture, in any number of, of large industries, in security and defense. Um, that, that's what the next three or five years are about.
What's next for Intel when you look at this landscape and the ecosystem developing? Where do you see in, in industry going, but also where Intel is going to take the industry? I mean, I think today, you know, today we have a product that is uh, is really well optimized for uh, for training, uh, training, fine tuning of of open models, you know, standard standard frameworks, um, and and deployment, of course, right, inferencing. I mean, we see, you know, what, what we've announced with Gaudi three, we're very excited about the uh, you know the inferencing performance we see, right, um, you know, twice, uh, you know, two x the 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 current uh, you know current available solutions in terms of uh, you know uh, performance per you know per per dollar per watt, very efficient. Um, you know, really pleased with that um, with that product. We're also seeing, um, you know, we're also seeing that uh, programmability is in our future with what we talked about with Falcon Shores, and we're going to continue to innovate and deliver solutions to customers at all levels of the stack. And our and our commitment to open, you know, we announced in April the open platform for enterprise AI. Um, yeah. We've now recently launched a few services on that, so RAG, um, you know, some some capabilities around um, around software development, you know, code gen. For example, and and we see, you know, we just see more and more um, um, services and capabilities that we need to enable through open source tools. And then at the infrastructure level, I think we'll continue to see more specialization. Shimon, I want to thank you for the partnership because we have published now a Juniper validated design that combines our Ethernet based solution with your solution, and hopefully uh, that will be a, a good um, example of a proof point of where the industry is going. Lastly, I want to ask you a question about since you have much better visibility uh, into customers, as customers are building these large data centers, AI data centers, do you see any unique challenges they're facing that we should be aware of? Yeah, I, I think there's um, ma actually massive challenges. Um, we actually did a survey with uh, around 1,500 organization, organizations and um Ask them what are your challenges. So some of the challenges is how do I feed the accelerators. Another challenge is how do I secure my data. Another challenge is actually how do I manage my data at scale. And it's interesting because there's these challenges, but then on the other hand, we see a lot of common uh, mistakes that are being done when designing these data centers. So for example, one of the most glaring one is that uh, storage is in many cases is an afterthought. We see customers. Uh, or environments um, saying, okay, I'm, I bought my GPUs. That's it. I have my AI data center. Oh, but I need networking. Oh, but I need storage. So it's oh. almost like afterthought. Uh, and then, or another thing is, let's try to use what we already have. So you, we invested so much in, in our, our uh, accelerators, but let's use our old networking or let's use our old storage. Um, it, it It's a pity because you then you don't optimize on the investment that, that you did. Uh, another common mistake is um, to to just design for multiple different storage environments. So here's my block storage for this. Here's my object storage for that. Here's my NFS storage for uh, th that's a mistake. You th this creating these new AI data centers requires a different approach, and and technology is already at the point where it can offer this new approach, right? So you can benefit from it. Um, and I think there's. If I would mention uh, one or two more things, there's the, the um, when you're creating this data center, especially when we're talking about the networking aspect, actually, these data centers, um, organizations are, are now global. They're on-prem, yeah. they're on cloud, they're on private clouds, they're on multiple on-prem. Maybe I'm ingesting data in one environment, I'm, I'm training on it in another environment, I'm inferencing it back here or there. So the ability to be able to burst between different locations to first of all have the network pipelines between these different locations, but right? also to have the ability to to have the data platform that can send the data to different locations at scale because everybody can move a few gigabytes, single digit terabytes, but try to move multiple petabytes in an efficient way. That, that's a big challenge. So uh, planning for that also in advance uh, is important. Right. Now, Shimon, uh, that's why in this panel we have you as well as we have people representing uh, compute as well as GPU or AI accelerators. So I think together, uh, to your point, if we could start creating this sort of uh, uh, reference designs, which are, we bring all these components together in an interoperable manner, but they're optimized, like you said, for different uh, use cases, rather than they become afterthought. I'm look, And we look forward to working with you, really. Um, I think this will be a good 
the thing for the industry to be able to bring these pieces together in a way that are optimized together uh, rather than having to invest into any particular vertical integrated solution. 